Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. It's now time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe. The Central Bank of Nigeria says its policy of cash withdrawal limits is not based on polit politics, contrary to insinuations. The Deputy Governor of Financial Systems Ability of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Aisha Ahmed, made this known on Thursday when she answered questions from lawmakers at the House of Representatives. The approval of the restriction. We are seeing it as an opportunity for the ruling party to raise out opposition parties. The current trend of inflation in the country, there is every need for them to get the higher denominations because you will go to the market, you won't get back of grain at the cost of not less than 30,000 now. Can the CBN tell Nigerians how much was printed out of this new currency? How much was printed? Not approved by this honorable institution? Or how did the CBN obtain the funds to print these new notes? If you had consulted with us, we would have brought these perspectives to you to look at and to examine and re-examine and re-examine until we come to uh, a good meeting place. To make it very, very clear that the CBN is an independent institution. Our decisions are taken based on research, data, and it is the work of many teams working together across the different directorates. At no time do we make decisions based on any political considerations, and I think it's important that I understate that. The data that we have, even in states that don't have cashless today, I reeled out the numbers. All those transaction amounts are below the minimums that we've put today. So they are not even affected by the fees. A lot to speak about, Dr. Bati. Policy not politically motivated. Well, I think uh, <clears throat> Dr. Aisha Ahmad, who was representing uh, CBN Governor Godwin A. Mayfield, made a number of points, basically reiterating the position of the CBN and the same points that Godwin A. Mayfield himself had made previously uh, when he appeared before the Senate. But he couldn't appear before the House of Representatives, the first time they invited him. Second time now, the uh, House of Representatives agreed that he could send a representative. And uh, the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank, Dr. Aisha Ahmad, uh, went in there and uh, you know, represented the uh, institution. But it is important to know that she did not deviate from anything else that the CBN had put out there in the public domain. And she made a number of points that are instructive. The first point is that the CBN is an independent body. We keep saying it, Section 1, Subsection 3 of the CBN Act says clearly that the CBN shall discharge its duties as an independent body. So all these attempts by politicians, by lawmakers, to think that, oh, they should have been consulted before, you know, the CBN uh, approach, uh, you know, announce a monetary policy. I think, you know, it's a bit uh, beyond the pale. Uh, the CBN, no CBN uh, anywhere in the world goes first to consult uh, politicians before it makes uh, its decisions, particularly if you have a parliament that is dominated by a particular political party. But I think the politicians are overreaching themselves in that regard, maybe perhaps because of this, you know, uh, uh, feeling that uh, Mr. Mifili himself dabbled into politics. He even wanted to be president of Nigeria. We saw vehicles with posters. So they are now tempted to think he's one of them. And even in the discharge of his professional duties, he's properly duty bound uh, to come and cause them. No, that's not what the CBN Act says, okay? It's monetary policy. The lawmakers are in the business of lawmaking. If they want to change the law, they can change the law. But to assume that they can make policies, they cannot. However, they can ask questions about a policy that can affect the people. And of course, I assume that they are within that zone. But to go beyond that would be a bit uh, overboard. If they're within that zone, we have seen the impact that has had. It has influenced the uh, CBN, for example, to say it has listened to people 
to the concerns of the populace, not the concerns of politicians, the concerns of the people. And hence, it has uh, tried to adjust the cash withdrawal limit. Now, on the issue of cash withdrawal limit, Dr. Ahmad uh, made it very clear that this was not targeted at anybody. And that was the same point that Temi Fiele had made when he appeared personally, that this is not targeted at politicians. And Dr. Ahmed was a stepfather by saying it was a product of research, of consultations within the uh, system, and they arrived at that initial figure. But now they've reviewed it, just uh, listening to people. Third, you know, the CBM through her also outlined the advantages of the de uh, redesign of the Naira and this uh, cashless, uh, uh, cashless policy that they say they are pursuing. Since 2012, it was made, the point was made that Nigeria has had an improvement in electronic payment system. And that electronic payment system has uh, deepened financial inter intermediation. It has increased um, uh, you know, um, innovation. It has also you know, energized uh, policy. And that to the extent that today we have electronic payment systems, even in rural areas in Nigeria. Well, how widespread that is, you know, remains to be seen. But beyond that, you know, the argument of the CBN is that these new policies will help to check terrorism, banditry, counterfeiting, kidnapping. And I think that these are, you know, are important uh, points. Now, a third point or a fourth point that needs to be made is that the uh, representative of the CBN was asked a question. How much money did you print, CBN? And she said she had no idea. Uh, and the uh, lawmakers were alarmed. How would the CBN know how much, uh, how much currency is printed? And that question came about out of concern that nobody has seen the new notes in many places, except if you go to uh, an event, a social event center or you go to the, uh, uh, to the some bureau de change outlets, you know, how come some other elements outside the system have these new notes and the new notes are not available in the banking system? Even the uh, ATMs, the automatic teller machines, you, they still give you the old notes. Okay, so the question is pertinent. How much exactly was printed? But Dr. Ahmad said, well, she didn't want to give the wrong figure. That's why she didn't say it. You know, well, I, I hope it's not a case of she not knowing exactly how much was printed, because I think we have the right to know. There's nothing about national security in that regard. I mean, if you printed a, a one billion, let us know. And then we will ask the consequential question. So why is this money not in the uh, in the banking vaults? Because if you go to the banks, the bank uh, the uh, bankers will tell you they have not given us any money, or they did not give us enough, or the little they gave us uh, has been exhausted. Now, Dr. Ahmed says, you know, they have uh, they are going to print 500 million. Uh, she's sure about that. But when will that 500 million naira? When will it? Uh, arrive. So these are some of the issues uh, uh, raised. But I, I took also special notice of the fact that members of the House of Representatives uh, told the CBN that, look, the CBN and commercial banks have an obligation to make Forex available, particularly for students who are schooling abroad and who need to pay school fees. Well, everybody is looking for foreign exchange. The uh, aviation sector looking for looking for foreign exchange, everybody else looking for uh, foreign exchange. But that of students is particularly uh, disturbing. You go to the banks to get forex, to pay school fees. No, they will tell you that uh, they don't have a foreign currency. Or they will tell you that it's a long queue if you are willing to wait for five months or whenever forex is available. And meanwhile, these schools have calendars. Many children have dropped out of school because uh, their parents have difficulties accessing uh, Forex. And I, I, I can understand, I can imagine that the lawmakers were speaking as concerned parents who may have also faced uh, the same problem. But the key issue, as recommended by the World Bank, is that we still have to address this issue of Forex supply, which is causing problems not just in aviation, but also in the downstream sector of uh, oil and gas, and also everywhere else within the economy. And the basic recommendation is that, can we have a unified uh, you know, a foreign exchange rate? But it looks like it's so difficult for 
the CBN to act on that while it's acting on other things. Absolutely. Just to add a few points in terms of the um, fact that the deputy governor of the CBN, Mrs. Aisha Ahmed, faced the House of Representatives and was questioned with regards to the new policy. Yesterday, we had discussed the fact that they had invited the governor of the CBN, and due to circumstances beyond his control, including his health, he couldn't present himself. And, you know, like Dr. Bati mentioned, they agreed for Mrs. Ahmed, who is the deputy uh, governor on financial system stability. Um, to appear before them. I'd like to speak to what she said with regards to the fact that the cashless policy came into, um, was introduced in 2012. Therefore, this is 10 years post the cashless policy. I'll take us back again to the, uh, what the CBN governor had said after his meeting with the president in Daura, saying that at what point are we going to implement the cashless policy? At one point, is Nigeria going to go cashless? And she presented facts and data to represent the fact that they were in the right direction, and the CBN has to take sometimes drastic uh, measures or perhaps introduce what could be considered as drastic policies to ensure that this, you know, we, we actualize and achieve a cashless, um, a cashless Nigeria. Now, let's take um, an example from Sweden. Sweden is said to now have less than 1% of transactions done in cash less than 1%. In fact, they are supposed to be one of the first countries in the world to be a fully cashless nation. How did it work and what has worked for Sweden? What has worked for them is that they deepened their financial system in terms of payments available. There was public education. This is very important because even in developed countries like Sweden, there's a sentimental attachment and a cultural bias towards cash and the usage of cash, very similar to what we have here in Nigeria. So there was a lot of public education and then there was widespread adoption of the use of card methods for payment. This was what made it work. Now, using the Indian example, because the lawmakers have talked about the fact that Sweden and Nigeria, apples and oranges. In India, which has a population size that is at least um, com um, co comparable in terms of the Nigerian factor, what worked or what didn't work for them initially when they started was that they didn't have the technological infrastructure to um, to promote a cashless society. This is what we're facing in Nigeria as well. There was also the cultural bias towards money, again tackled by public education, which is what we talked about again and again. Anyways, there's a whole uh, there's a whole analysis between these nations and as it pertains to Nigeria. However, the reason I pointed this out is because I want to reiterate again, at what point are we going to be ready based on the many, many benefits have been highlighted by both the CBN governor and the deputy governor of the CBN FSS on the benefits of a cashless society, money laundering, the image of Nigeria on, on the international world, the ability of vulnerable Nigerians, as she classed them, to be absorbed into um, the you know into the financial system and also take advantage of economic opportunities. Many things to have a conversation about. Of course, this is not the end. It took Sweden about over 20 years. Nigeria is in its 10th year. We're looking forward to a truly cashless um, you know, society based on the benefits highlighted. I move on to the next story. And presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Bola Tinubu, has said there was no going back on fuel subsidy removal if elected president next year. Tinubu, who stated this while speaking at the business launch on with business owners titled Business Forward yesterday in Lagos, hinted that no matter how long people protest, it would not stop him from removing fuel subsidy. Tinubu, in a statement by his media office signed by Mr. Tunde Rahman, insisted that Nigeria would not continue to subsidize fuel consumption in neighboring countries. He also promised to work towards creating a better security in the country to allow them an enabling environment to do their businesses, adding that business and insecurity cannot thrive side by side. This, this um, conversation on subsidy, Dr. Bati, has come up again and again, and the importance to do and just to do it once and for all. Your take on this. OK. Um the presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress was in Lagos yesterday, uh, and he met with, uh, again, the business uh, community at an event, a town hall, uh, with the theme, Business Forward. And it was on that occasion that he said, he will remove subsidy, no matter, you know, the uh, protest. And you know, of course, many Nigerians have been protesting against any talk about removal of subsidy. And I think uh, many will remember what happened in 2012 when, you know, the phrase used then was not removal of subsidy, but deregulation of the downstream sector. And it caused uh, 
a lot of riots. And at that time, ironically, um, Ashwajobola met you know, and his allies, you know, were some of those people who opposed the attempt by the uh, government uh, to deregulate the downstream sector, what some people call removal of subsidies. So it's interesting to see that 10 years down the line, Ashwa Jubala Ahmed Tinubu, presidential candidate of the APC, is now you know, a convert to the idea of the removal of subsidy. Because in 10 years, uh, the uh, subsidy regime, which in 2012 was pointed out as being unsustainable, and even before then, um, had resulted in loss of revenue for government. Money that should uh, be used for developmental purposes is diverted into subsidizing the consumption of uh, petrol. The diesel had been deregulated, kerosene had been deregulated, but petrol could not be deregulated because people opposed it. The president, President Buhari himself, you know, uh, well, having agreed that yes, subsidies should be removed, in an interview with Bloomberg, talked about consequences, in other words, social consequences. That is, in terms of maybe the protest that may attend government's decision. And under the uh, PIA and all of that, government was supposed to have removed subsidy. But government decided in its wisdom that it will postpone it till uh, June next year, uh, I guess because of those consequences. And we said at the time that, look, this is a tough decision that needs to be made. And what the Buhari administration has done is to move it to the next administration. So it's instructive to see the presidential candidate of the APC saying that he will remove subsidy. Because to remove subsidy will be in order, the economists tell us, because what you do is actually to subsidize the rich and punish the majority. And secondly, it will require courage. As we have seen in Kenya, President Ruto promised that he will remove a, a subsidy. He promised that he will do a number of things. Well, removal of a petroleum subsidy in uh, Kenya, they have moved it till January now, after Christmas, in order not to disturb people. But there are a number of things that he promised that he did. Immediately, he got to power. We hope that if Ashwa Jubala Ahmed Tinubu wins, yes, he will summon the courage to take that decision because it will be one of the ways of reducing waste, of uh, you know, making uh, uh, the economy more productive. Subsidy in Nigeria this year alone has taken trillions of Naira. Okay? That money, if it was available, could be, uh, could be used for other things to build, develop infrastructure. But at that forum, he said other things. How it will increase the uh, strength of the military forces, how it will ensure security, because you can't do business if this country is not secure. How it would provide an enabling environment for the private sector by ensuring that you know, the private sector thrives uh, under its watch. He talked about education. He talked about uh, reducing uh, poverty. Well, the same things you know, that uh, he has said and how you know, uh, business entrepreneurs should have confidence if he is elected. Of course, the entrepreneurs themselves uh, raise questions. And some of the questions they raised was about Forex. This same Forex we're talking about. And he was saying that, look, as president of Nigeria, he will not allow a multiple foreign exchange rate. Okay? They asked him about other things, you know, and uh, subsidy in particular. And that was in that context uh, that he, he responded. But on the whole, you know, politicians make promises. But what every politician should note is that the public is taking notes. And there are concrete things that we can hang on to with every presidential candidate. So whoever wins will just play back the tape and say, you promised to do this, you promised to do this, when are you going to do it? But in terms of articulation of uh, issues, well, I think uh, Ashwa Jibola Metinubu did very well, addressed all the key points, uh, in my view. But the subsisting question, the eternal question, is how the devil 
is in the details. Absolutely. Absolutely, Dr. Abati. The devil is in the details. And just to just very quickly uh, say that when the, the issue of subsidy and the conversation around this, one of the arguments uh, for why people are against this is the high cost of the, of the burden on the people. Now, it has been pro said by analysts again and again that subsidy is not sustainable. We'll have to bite the bullet at some point in, uh, you know, in the cycle of this nation. However, you know, with Ashwajubal Ahmed Tinubu coming out decisively to say that if he does become president, he will take out, you know, he will take out subsidy. Let's look at the situation on ground now. For those who have said that, don't take it out because the people will suffer in terms of high cost of um, PMS. We have a fuel scarcity on our hands at the moment. People are willing to pay exorbitant, exorbitant amount above the stipulated price just to be able to have access to fuel. If we're able to pay this, does it not demonstrate that people would be willing if, if there's an assurance that would have a um, consistent supply, we would not have to be on the queues and Nigerians wouldn't have to suffer, that would have to pay this price one way or the other. Therefore, let us begin to get used to an idea of subsidy removal without protests.